Greetings, friends of Dina Rose Ministries. If you are interested in having Dina come and speak at any of your church or organizational events, please contact us at srose at dinarose.com. Say, it's been a rough week. Steve and I got a touch of food poisoning. And I am still not over it, you guys. So y'all just going to have to bear with me. I I can't even remember the last time I sat down to share. You guys bear with me. We're going to muddle through. As mom said this afternoon, the word must go on. So the word is going forward tonight. Amen. We're going to continue tonight on the series that you guys have been working on on Wednesday nights, Where Lions Feed. And where we were tonight is Lions Feed, Where Dead carcasses lie lions feed where dead carcasses lie this has been a really good series have you guys been enjoying it we tune in on wednesday nights and uh we've been listening in and it's been really really good to be reminded that you know we have a real enemy out there and he's always looking to pounce the bible says that he roams around as though he were a roaring lion. It doesn't say he is necessarily, but he likes to intimidate us and he likes to make us think that he is. And he's constantly roaring and he's constantly raising his ugly head and he looks for moments whenever he can pounce and when he can really demolish and tear up the sheep. And uh, one of the places that he does that is where dead carcasses lay. So that's where we're headed tonight. Turn with me, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. Bub, I forgot to give you a list, so I'm not sure. I don't know really how it works back there. If you guys can find it on the spur of the moment, if you have to have it in ahead of time, then you guys just bear with us. Is there any way we can lower these just a hair? It's extremely hot, and I'm already sweating and out of breath, so we're going to have to make it work. (laughs) All right, Hebrews chapter 6, starting at verse number 1. The writer of the Hebrews, which we assume to be the Apostle Paul, was saying, Therefore, leaving the discussions of the elementary principles of Christ, Let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundations of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Paul was charging the church that, you know what, we have to go a little bit deeper. We can't keep dwelling on the shallow things of the faith. It's time that we must go in a little bit deeper. We can't lay again the foundations that we've already laid to you, of which is the repentance from dead works. There is part of our Christian faith that once we grow in the Lord, we have to come out of that area of dead works. Because if we don't, we're going to be a prey where the enemy is going to pounce. Dad left me an illustration to share with you guys about two, two photographers who were out trying to take a picture in the uh, plains of Africa. I guess that's what it's called, the deserts. What, what's it called in Africa? Wherever the animals are over there. And they came upon the dead carcass of a zebra. It was a little bit down a hill, so they parked the, the uh, vehicle that they were in, and they tried to sneak down the side of the hillside to get a picture of the dead carcass. They didn't see any animals around it at all. And they thought, all right, we got this. Let's get down there and get some pictures. Maybe we can see, figure out what happened to this zebra. Was it, did it come upon some other animals? Did it die of natural causes? What's the deal? Well, one of the photographers had left something that he needed up in the vehicle, so he runs back up the the hill, and in his haste to get back down to get these photos, he left the back of the vehicle open. He gets back down there, and as he and the other photographer are taking the pictures, all of a sudden they start hearing this small little roar coming not too far in the distance, and he thought, oh, no. So they turned around and they took a look and there was a lioness who was sitting there waiting for who was going to come upon that dead carcass. In case you didn't know it, lions in the wild can be very smart and they can set traps for people. (laughs) Believe it or not, they can set a trap. Sometimes they can pull a dead carcass into an area to where they know either other animals are going to come around it 
to feast upon it, and then they know that they're going to have dinner on what is coming to feast. In this case, it happened to be two photographers who happened their way. Well, they got so afraid and so scared that they hauled back up the hill, and thank goodness that that guy left the, the hatch up on the vehicle because they were able to jump in and pull it down just in time as this lioness tries to charge and jump into the vehicle behind them. If we're not careful, that's exactly what the enemy of our souls will do to us. He is looking for where dead carcasses lie. Because where the dead things are, he can feed. And we have to be very careful because in our Christian walk, it is super easy to become dead and us not even know it. So we're going to take a look at a couple of verses tonight that's going to show us how that happens. Turn over just a couple chapters to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, and we're going to look at verse number 14. Actually, let's go up to, chapter, to verse 13, bud. We're going to start with 13 and read both of those. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh... How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works in order to serve the living God? That is a really powerful passage of scripture because he is, he is reminding us once again that, listen, the blood of bulls and goats was good for a season, the ashes of those heifers were good for a season because they were what was holding you until the perfect sacrifice came. But once the perfect sacrifice came, then those things are no longer, those, they're no longer good. You can no longer be covered by the sacrifices of animals because you have been covered by the blood of Jesus. And if you're covered by the blood of Jesus, that must cleanse your conscience from dead works. So what exactly are the dead works? How do we become those dead carcasses that lie around waiting for the enemy to come in and to pounce us? 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. You guys will have to bear with me. I'm flipping with you guys. I did not mark my pages before we came. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and this is going to be a little lengthy. We're going to start at verse number 4. And we're going to read all the way down to verse number 18 to see if we can get a picture. I believe that there are two kinds of dead things, okay? And I'm going, I'm going off of Dad's notes just a little bit. I took his outline. He said, do whatever you want to with it. If you want to add a little to it, if you want to remove some of it, however you need to go. And these are the two directions where I felt like the Lord was leading me with the dead carcasses. Because I think that in the church, there are two ways that we can become dead and not even know it. One way that we become dead is being religious. And we think we're serving Jesus, but we're really just being religious. And we're going to look at that. And then another way that we can become dead is that we become so faith-minded and so, uh, for lack of a better word, flaky. Isn't that what the world calls us? Especially in the Pentecostal realms. That we can become so flaky that we leave the substance, the holiness, and the righteousness that God calls us to undone. Both of those extremes leaves us dead. And when we become a dead carcass, or when we begin to hang around the dead carcasses, we are extremely open to the prey of the enemy. Now let me just insert this here before we go on. Whenever I make that statement, when we hang around the dead carcasses, do you know that there are many times throughout the scriptures that the apostles reminded us that those who within the body cause trouble are those who are of the faith that are not doing things that are uh, worthy of the call of repentance, that we are to forsake being around them, that we are to mark them, that we are to call them out. As a matter of fact, in one passage of scripture, he even goes so far as to say, do not even eat with such a one. Now, he was not talking about people of the world, and he was not talking about sinners, because sinners do what sinners do. And sometimes the way that we get into their life and that we become part of their trust is to be around them a little bit without 
compromising our standard. Paul said, I have become all things to all people for the sake of winning more, but not as to without law unto Christ. We don't change who we are. We don't compromise our faith. We don't compromise our values. We don't become like they are. If we want to go to dinner with another couple and they're not saved, they're not Christians and they're going to be drinking alcohol. We don't order the alcohol and start cussing along with them to make them feel like we understand and we relate because then we become no different than they are. We have no, no way to pull them up higher. We've become what they are. We are to be around those who are outside of the household of faith, but read your Bible because sometimes those who name themselves a brother or sister in Christ that do not live a life worthy of the call. Now, I'm, I'm talking about a consistent, habitual lifestyle that brings harm to the gospel message, that brings harm to the body of Christ. The Bible says to withdraw and separate and don't even eat with them. They are dead carcasses, and hanging out around dead carcasses is going to leave you wide open to the enemy. Because I can bet you beyond everything, if you hang out with negative people long enough, you may think you're going to win them. You may think that you're going to bring them to a higher standard. I remember one time whenever I was in high school, and it has been an illustration that has stayed with me my whole life. We had the power team come to an assembly that we were in. I don't know if you guys know who the power team is. I don't even know if they're, do they still go around? They were a group of bodybuilders. I'm talking about big, massive guys. You know, I mean, they were like, well, in 2023, I don't know that too many people would know that kind of man anymore. We're bringing it back, y'all. We're going to make macho cool again. Is that all right? We're going to make masculine cool again. Matter of fact, we need to make us some t-shirts, I think. Make masculine cool again. But at any rate, these, y'all, it's going to be so hard for me to sit down. Can y'all see me all right trying to get up? These guys came to the assemblies that we were in, and they were busting blocks with their hands and their heads. You know, they would just hit them, and the boards would pop open. And these were just some really masculine guys. And he gets up there to tell all of us kids about the importance of who we're hanging around and the influences that we have in our life. And he said, all of you in here probably think that you can be friends with the most vile kid in this school and that you're going to be able to witness to them and bring them to Jesus. And he said, the chances are that maybe one in a hundred, you might be able to do that. So he got this kid out of the audience, and he was this scrawny, I, I honestly think, now he didn't say this, but if I could read his mind, I think that he probably scalloped the audience and found the scrawniest looking dude in the place that had no muscles, no nothing, because here he was like a Steve Reeves kind of guy. And here was this little puny guy he called out of the audience, and he called him over to the edge of the platform. And when he got him over to the edge of the platform, he, he said, I just want you to bury your feet, and I'm going to try with everything in my mic to pull you up on this platform with me. It probably was about two and a half feet elevated, I guess. There was no stairs like here. It was just a wall. So he pulled the guy, and he pulled the guy, and he was able to elevate him a little bit because, remember, this was a big, massive guy. He was strong, and he pulled him just a little bit. But he told that kid, he says, now, I want you to watch what happens with me. He said, I'm going to plant my feet, and I'm going to dig in as hard as I can, and I want you to pull against me as hard as you can and see if you can pull me off of this wall. Well, this kid thought, man, there ain't no hope. I mean, he was like Barney Fife up against Steve Reeves, you know? That's, that's not going to happen, like an Arnold Schwarzenegger guy. I don't know. So this kid is sitting there, and he's like, okay, but I'm going to go for it. And he started tugging on the guy, and it was pretty tough. I got to tell you, it was a little bit of a struggle. But within probably about 60 to 90 seconds, that scrawny little kid with not a muscle in his body had that big old tough guy down on the floor. And he said, let me tell you, it is always easier for those kind of people to bring you down than it will ever be for you to bring them up. That has stood with me my entire life because it is so true. Negativity is like a cancer 
that when you get around it, you just, uh, you just feel your spirit dropping. I have made it a habit as I've gotten older. I don't hang out with negative people. If you're going to be negative and you're going to be critical and you're going to be one of those kind, you're not going to be in my inner circle because life is too short for that. Life is too short for that. Before you know it, little seeds are planted into your mind that cause doubt, doubt about the Father, doubt about his goodness, doubt about his provision. It gets into your mind. Your mind is the soil. When we read about the seeds that were sown, some on good soil, rocky soil, stony soil, and all that that we read about, that is your mind. That is your heart. And when those seeds are sprinkled onto the soil of your mind, they will take root if you're not careful. They become a dead thing, a dead carcass that will leave you wide open to the enemy. And if you're not careful, it will not be very long to where you will be full out pounced on by the enemy and you will be missing out with God a whole lot faster than you thought it would happen. So 2 Corinthians chapter 3, starting at verse number 4. You guys stick with me. It's a little bit lengthy. And we have such trust through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, okay, now I want you to hear the words that was just spoken there. If the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, do you know what it's talking about there? Who knows what it's talking about there? Nope, not the tombstones. It is actually talking about the law. When Moses brought down the law, it was engraved on stones, and the Bible says here it was glorious. Because it had a purpose and it had its season. Okay, and not that we do away with the law. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill the law. Everything that was in the law was fulfilled in Christ. So let's keep going. So that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of the countenance, which glory was passing away. How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious. In other words, the law was limited in what it could do. It could not cover and take away your sin. All that it could do was, was take your sin for a brief season of time, one year, until the next day of atonement came around. That's all it could do. It was temporal in its meaning. Moses brought down the law that pointed people to know, listen, you need a savior. Because there's so much in this thing that you can't do it without one. You are going to forever be killing bulls. You're going to forever be sacrificing pigeons. You're going to forever be sacrificing doves because there's nothing in you that is good. You cannot do it without a savior. And if that was glorious, even though it fell way short, think how much more glorious the spirit of life is. This is what Paul was trying to say. Listen, we've done away with that. We still walk by the law because the spirit guides us. He directs us. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. When we're in Jesus, we naturally fulfill the law. But it was limited in its purpose. It is now the spirit of life. It is having relationship with Jesus. And how much more glorious. Verse 9. For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, that's the law, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more glory. How much more glorious is it to have freedom in Christ? For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, then what remains is much glorious more glorious. In other words, the law in all its beauty, in all its glory, in its design to point us to a savior was glorious, 
But it was passing away for the fulfillment to come, for the completion of that to come, and how much more glorious it is that remains. Verse 12. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. His glory was fading. When he came down off of the mountain, if you remember the story, they could not even look upon him because he had been in the presence of God. That presence was fading. And he had to put a veil over it so that the children of Israel did not see and could not see the passing of the glory. But their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. But the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, I don't know how many of you guys, because I don't know if I, I don't know a lot of you as far as your history, how many of you grew up in church, if you grew up in a Pentecostal church, if you grew up in a different kind of church, but I can remember growing up. One of the things that I, we came off at the end, kind of middle to the end there of the Jesus revolution, that's when mom and dad got saved. And for all these critics out there right now who are wanting to say that the Jesus revolution was nothing but a hippie movement, that it didn't affect the, uh, it didn't affect the culture at large. I just want to tell you that whenever I look at my kids and I see them up here worshiping and whenever I can come in here and the glory and the anointing that is up here on this platform through this beautiful worship that was going forward tonight, just to be able to sit in his presence, even when you don't feel good and your body is suffering all kinds of things. It's like whenever David would play his heart before Saul. Whenever I watch my kids walking in that anointing, don't tell me that the Jesus revolution was nothing but a passing hippie movement. Because my mom and dad got saved in that passing hippie movement. My mom and dad brought us kids up with what they learned in that Jesus revolution. And now we have a whole nother generation who's growing up. And I know that my kids are going to take that to even another generation. Whenever we come off of those, of those kind of movements, though, it's like you begin to be so enamored with wanting to please God so much that if you're not careful, a lot of legalism, a lot of laws can kind of be laid down. And people do that for a right reason. When you read through the New Testament, you see the Pharisees and the Sadducees, man, they were all about the law. They were perfect in following the law. But let me tell you, it was those Pharisees and Sadducees that had Jesus, the Christ, the fulfillment of the law, murdered. They were so zealous for the law of Moses that they didn't even realize they missed the fact that the law of Moses was all about pointing people to the need of a Savior. And when the Savior came, they missed him because he didn't look like what they thought the law looked like. He was the beautiful fulfillment of the law. Nothing in him was in error or in contrast to the law. But because it was a little bit different, and here's, here's what I've come to learn. I wish that I would have written this scripture down, but I didn't because at the time I didn't realize that I would be speaking tonight, so I didn't know that it would be pertinent, but you're just going to have to trust me. It's there. I believe it's in the book of Luke. I'm not sure. You guys can search it out. But whenever Jesus was talking to his disciples... And he was talking about the law. Here's one thing he said. He brought it back around to the traditions of men. Do you know that they had become so good at trying to follow the law so closely, so tightly, that they began to make a lot of things laws that was never in the law of Moses? That really jumped out at me this time around reading it. I mean, we've always known it. If you've ever read through your Bible, you know that one because the Bible talks about that we make the gospel of no effect because of the traditions of man. 
We become so legalistic, so rigid, so religious in our practice that we can make the true gospel of no effect. And that's what Jesus was saying, listen, listen. They were getting on to him because his disciples didn't wash their hands before they had a meal. And they're like, hey, listen, you know, they gotta, they're supposed to wash their hands. They didn't wash their hands and, oh, that's awful. And Jesus comes back at him and he says, listen, the guys are hungry. They need to eat. There isn't a labor right here for them to wash themselves, but they need sustenance for their body. You guys have made such rules and such practice out of your own traditions that God the Father never gave, and you are stifling the things that are more important. That is a place where dead carcasses lay. How many of the Pharisees and Sadducees missed out with Jesus because they were so worried about the letter of the law? And here it is. When you are so consumed with following the letter of the law that you begin to build upon that with your own idea of what that law should be, you have now stepped over into religion and legalism, and it brings death to you and everybody around you. A relationship with Jesus Christ transcends all of that. And if you are communicating with him every single day and you are staying connected to him in prayer, in devotion, in Bible study, I can guarantee you, you are going to naturally fulfill the law because the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of you. And the Bible says that the Spirit guides us into all truth. He takes us into all truth. He is not going to let you fall away. If you are struggling with feeling like you are not doing enough to obey the scriptures, if you are, feel like you've got to get up every day and do a certain amount of things and a certain number of ritualistic things to make yourself proved to God, then you're not yet free in the spirit. Jesus wants you free in the spirit because it is the spirit who gives life. And if you don't find a way to get there, you will become a dead carcass that is open prey for the enemy because he's going to constantly riddle you with guilt and condemnation because you can't do it on your own. It doesn't matter how good you try to be. I can remember a time after Steve and I got married, probably for the first five years we were married, every single night. I think I've told you all this before. I would lay in the bed before I would go to sleep, and I would tell him, I'd say, man, I just feel like I've done something wrong today. And he'd say, what? What could you have possibly done? i said, I don't know. I just feel like I've done something so wrong. Because I was riddled with guilt and condemnation because I was trying in my own works of the flesh to please the Father instead of receiving and building a genuine relationship with Jesus. You don't want to be there, my friends, because that kills the Bible says that the law brings death, but the Spirit brings life. Let's read one more passage about that. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That one phrase right there is very important, and this is where I think a lot of Christians, um, I believe that a lot of Christians who fall into the practice of being legalistic err here because they don't want to walk in the flesh. They want to be so careful that they don't walk in the flesh that they begin to become too rigid. They're not free to walk according to the Spirit because, quite honestly, I'm not sure that a lot of us, enough of us, really know how. Verse number two, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to to the spirit simply put Jesus came to once and for all take care of that Jesus took the penalty of sin he became sin he who knew no sin became sin that we may be called the righteousness of God in Christ 
When we're walking in a relationship with Jesus, when we love him and when we are absorbing this word into our heart, we don't have to worry about that. Because his spirit leads us and guides us. Now, before we move on to the second, the second part of this, this is what I want to tell you. If you find yourself in this place where you feel like, okay, I found myself being very legalistic, very rigid, very religious, trying to fulfill all the points of the law, I got to do enough to earn God's favor, then I want to release you from that tonight. I want to tell you that if you love Jesus and you've invited him into your life and you've made him Lord of your life and you are yearning every day to know him more and to live according to the word, you're going to naturally fulfill the law because he is the law. How many of you have watched that scene in The Chosen where Jesus is in a temple? Oh, I love it. It's like my favorite part. Kristen couldn't wait for us to see it. And they tell him basically... Oh, I will have to punish you according to the law of Moses. And Jesus took that step forward and he said, I am the law of Moses. He is the law. He fulfilled it once and for all. And when we come into relationship with him and accept, accept the sacrifice he made, but here's the caveat to that. We also have to give that freedom to other people. Now, I know that y'all are probably looking at me and saying, what? Because you're probably one of the hardest preachers I know. <laughs> Always spanking somebody. There is a part to play, Galatians 6.1. I've said it to y'all enough. Y'all all should know it by heart by now. If you don't, then you tuned me out a long time ago. That if you see a brother sinning a sin that leads to death, then he who is more mature should call him to account on that. There is a time, a place, and a purpose for bringing to awareness whenever people are not walking quite where they should. But Jesus said in Matthew, listen, you better take that plank out of your own eye first. He didn't say, don't go remove the specks from your brother's eye. He never said that. Go read it. Because that's the way the world wants to say it right now. Oh, take the plank out of your own eye. Leave me alone. No. He never said, don't take the specks out. What he said was, take care of the plank that's in your own eye so that you may clearly be able to see to help the speck that's in your brother's. When we learn how to have a proper relationship with Jesus... And we are constantly working daily on how we can come up higher, how we can just be more like Christ, okay? Not that we're trying to make laws and rules and regulations for ourselves, but truly emulating the life of Christ, letting everything that is Jesus come through us, his love, his compassion, his mercy, his good works, all of that we should be doing. As we are doing that and as we are trying to perfect that in our own life, that's why the Bible says to let each man work out his own salvation. There is a place in our life for pastors, for prophets, teachers, apostles, and evangelists. We have to have teachers in our lives because it's really easy in this muddled world that we're in to get just a little bit off course. We have to be open to rebuke. We have to be open to exhortation. We have to be. But we cannot become so legalistic and so rigid in that, that we become like inspector generals or something over everybody's life, that if they're not doing theirs exactly like I'm doing mine, then they must be wrong and on their way to hell. This religion thing can leave dead carcasses both ways. It can leave dead carcasses for you if you are striving so hard that you're constantly under a guilt and condemnation that Christ never meant for you to feel. But it can also cause you to leave dead carcasses in your wake by killing everybody that you're trying to put your traditions of man upon. You know, I'll just take this one as an example. There is a certain denomination, I will not say it in here, just I don't feel like I need to, who don't believe that their women should wear makeup or pants. But I've been around a few of those women, and I'm going to tell you, they're some of the meanest old ladies you ever wanted to meet. Now, I'm just here to tell you, 
You ain't going to make it to heaven because you don't have pants on and because you ain't got makeup on. You're going to miss heaven a whole lot faster because you're mean as a snake. But that's one of those things that is a tradition of man because somewhere along the line, somebody took one passage of scripture out of context, and that passage of scripture was actually written during a time when men and women both wore dresses, tunics. Pants weren't even a thing back then. But somebody read one verse of scripture, took it out of context, and who knows? Maybe the Lord was saying to them personally, just like in our home, y'all know that we do not have television. We have a television where we can play a DVD player on. Um, Mom and dad got us a Roku stick a couple of years ago where we can pick up things like, um, well, we were watching Hallmark Channel till they started going woke, but now they got the GAC, so that's good. So we can pick that up if we want to. We can be very, very selective. The Lord told me that for me. If I were to then go into each and every one of your homes and say, you got to get the TV out, you got to get the TV out. You can't have a TV. Oh, you don't need a TV. Get the TV out. Now I'm taking what God spoke to me personally and trying to make it a rule for you. Do you see where I'm going? Sometimes God is going to require things of you that he may never require of someone else. And I'm not talking about there are some issues that's for us all across the board, period. There are some things that are in God's word that we all follow, no matter who you are. Red, white, yellow, brown, doesn't matter. It's in the law or it's in the book. But then there are other things that God's going to speak to us because he moves us. We just read it from glory to glory. He takes us from place to place. He's maturing us. He's constantly taking us higher. And as he does that, he may be requiring things of us that he's not yet requiring of somebody else. He may eventually get to that in their life. But maybe for them right now, he's just trying to get them to quit smoking. We can't make rules and regulations for people that is not explicitly written in the book. Because when we do, we leave dead carcasses. And that's where the enemy comes in. And he very quickly grabs hold of them. And he drags them out. And he takes them as his dinner. And a lot of those people we never see again. Now let's quickly hit the second part of this. The second part of this is when we become so free. That we forget that there is a responsibility in our faith and it leaves just as much damage in the wake. James chapter 2. James chapter 2 starting at verse 14. Now what does it profit my brethren if someone says he has faith but does not have works? All right, now I'm really fixing to get some people, maybe some of you watching online. Can faith save him? Is faith alone enough? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, I'll pray for you. That's not in there. I added that, by the way. Because that's just what we say. I'll pray for you. But you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now let's see how James expanded on that. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Okay, now, faith without works is dead. You can have works and not have faith because you're back under the law. You see where James is going with that? Show me your works without your faith, but I'm going to show you my faith by my works because you are living a life that you have dotted every I, you have crossed every T, you are tithing your cumin, your mint, and your dill, you're doing all the things, but you're leaving the weightier things undone. I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God? Well, pff, you do well. I can just hear James now, you know, because some of these apostles had attitude. You believe there's one God? 
you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. He's like, what good is that? So you tell me that you believe? You tell me you believe that Jesus died and was crucified? By now, James was the brother of Jesus. Jesus had already died. He's already resurrected. James is now fulfilling the ministry that he was called to. And he said, listen, you, you tell me now you believe? But you're not doing anything. You're not doing anything the master told us to do while he was here. What good does that profit you? Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Can you just imagine if a pastor walked up to somebody in the church now and said, Oh, you fool. You foolish man. Faith without works is dead. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect? He could have just said all day long that he believed. But it wasn't until he put Isaac on that altar that he really showed he believed. It was his works that justified his faith. We can say all day long that we believe in God, but the moment that a storm hits, what are we doing? We can say all day long that we believe God for healing in our bodies, but whenever the storm hits, what are we doing? You want to know what I did Monday night? Kristen comes in the bathroom because she was helping mama, and the first thing I said to her was, babe, pray. Let's pray. Let's just start praying. At that point, we didn't know, okay, is it just the flu? Is it, what is it? 30 minutes later, when Steve got up with the same thing, we realized, okay, this is a little more than that. Let's pray. What is your first set of recourse? Because you can say you believe all day long. You can say you believe all day long that he is Jehovah Jireh, your provider. But the moment that you get in, get, get in a bind and you can't see how ends are going to make it, what do you do? You can say it all day. But if you don't have works to back it up, it's a dead carcass. It's where the enemy can come in and get you because, believe you me, if you can't back up your profession of faith with works consistent with the word, he will devour you and pounce you and carry you out for the kill because it's how he is. <clears throat> Let's continue on verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. You can say all day long that you believe in Jesus. You can jump up and down. You can hoop and holler. You can have what seems to be the praise services of all praise services every time you come in this place. And where we are in the American church is we're at the point of a lot of people saying they believe, but there's not a lot of people living it right now. We would not be in this mess that we're in in our nation if God's people would have stood up when God's people should have stood up. If we had been putting into practice this faith that we say we have, if we had been putting into practice the good works that aligned with that faith, we would never be where we are right now. We're where we are right now because it's a whole lot easier to say we believe, to say we have a relationship with Jesus than it is to actually have a relationship with Jesus. It's a whole lot easier to say that we love people than it is for somebody to come our way in need and then to actually have to love people. And isn't it interesting? That's the first thing he started off with right there. The whole Ten Commandments are about loving God, loving people. Loving God, loving people. You know, whenever I watch these, we're going we're gonna to do just one more set of scriptures, and then you can slip to the piano. But even before I came out here tonight, I saw a video of a, of a transgender. He's a male, but he claims to be a woman. I don't play these political games. Call me, call me hateful. Accuse me of hate crime. I don't care, because I go by the word. You were born a male. You're a male. I love you. And I want to help you. I want to help you to come into the identity. We preached a whole sermon on that, I don't know, maybe a year ago. If you missed it, you can go find it on my YouTube channel. A whole, a whole night I did. 
towards the LGTB community. We love them. I have some that are in my family. I love them. Went to school with a few that were really great friends. But I will never look at you and call you a woman because I am not going to help the enemy steal your identity. I'm not going to do it. That is not love. That is delusion. And I'm telling you, if you're in this room or if you're watching online and you are participating in that with this community in the name of love, you are helping the devil. You have become the devil's tool and you're creating dead carcasses. Now, I don't know how much plainer I can say that because you should love people enough. I should love people enough to tell them the truth. This video that he posted was a call to arms, he called it. A call for the LGBTQ community to go buy guns, to go buy weapons, to learn how to use them, to arm themselves against Christians and against anyone who would try to stop a transgender female from using a female bathroom. And he said, you go ahead and protect your children. It'll be the last thing you did. There is an outright war that is raging around us. I can't tell you that enough. I tell you that almost every Sunday. The Bible calls it war. You are soldiers in the army of God. We are to contend for the faith. The problem with most Christians is they don't know their Bible. Now let me just say something in all the love that I can muster. And I'm serious when I say that. I hope that you guys know by now. There may be a harsh word that comes from me, but people would have thought that about Jesus too. <laughs> you know, whenever the Pharisees came to Jesus and they said, So, what's John the Baptist tell us? Was he a prophet? Was he sent from God? Jesus knew they were trying to trick him. He's like, mm, I'll tell you what. I'll answer your question when you answer mine. So he asked them a question. They wouldn't answer. He said, all right, I'm not answering yours either. I mean, like Jesus was not this milly mouth little whiny thing that we have portrayed Jesus to be, guys. Because he loved people enough to confront the issues that was dragging their soul to hell. If you love the gay and lesbian community the way you should, what did this right here just say? If you see a brother or sister that's in need, that doesn't just mean because they don't have clothes, don't have a place to sleep, they don't have food in their cupboard. That means all areas. If they're mentally struggling, if they're emotionally struggling, if you see someone who is in need and you fluff them off and you just say, I'll pray for you, then you are not putting works into action. Because I can tell you right now, Jesus wouldn't have done it. The Bible says that Jesus went about healing all who were sick, delivering them from devils. Jesus could look in his day. He saw the gay men. Don't think they didn't exist then. They did. People were passing their children through the fire to the god Molech way back in the Old Testament. You think abortion is new? This is all the same thing that is contrived by the same devils. And here's the problem. The reason why it has gotten to the place that it has gotten is because the church came lazy. The church became lazy. She was lulled into sleep being lied to by a false Christ who said, you've got to love, you've got to love, you've got to love, and we do love, but sometimes love means confrontation. Go ahead and, and slip to the piano, babe. Whenever Jesus came, you can stay there, bub, if you don't mind, just for a minute, because I do want to read these last few scriptures. Whenever Jesus came, when John the Baptist came, rather, he was fiery. He didn't come looking like people thought that a prophet would look like. Of course, none of them in the Old Testament did. If you go back and look at their lives, if you read their stories... He came confronting who? The religious crowd. Because it is the religious crowd that more often than not leaves the dead carcasses in its wake. It is either the religious that is so religious that they are only works focused and they have no spirit of life like we read at the beginning. 
Or it's the religious of crowd that is so fruity and flaky and so free love and all this that they don't have the works anymore. Both extremes kill. And depending on which extreme we fall into, we can become a tool in the enemy's hand. And sometimes it's for a right reason. Like I told you about the Pharisees, they honestly thought that they were pleasing Jehovah God by upholding what they felt like was the law of Moses. They just didn't realize that they had added a lot of points to the law that Moses never gave. And in contrast to that, we can become so faith-minded that we forget the practical work that, listen, it takes confronting people. Is that easy? No. No. You know how many times that I've had to sit across the table from somebody in a counseling room and tell them if you don't stop what you're doing, you're on your way to hell? But I love you enough to tell you that? Because if I just make believe that you're a woman, oh, here. Let me open the door to the women's bathroom. Come on in with me. You're good. No. It isn't because I don't love you. It's because I love you that I will tell you, straighten up and get in the men's bathroom. Because I can see that the enemy has grabbed clutches on your soul and is dragging you down to the pit. And you will enter into hell believing you're a woman. But trust me, when you get there, you're going to find out you're a man. Would you rather hurt their feelings this side of hell? It's just like a parent and a child. You know, I wish I could have let my kids do everything they wanted when they were little. They probably wish so too. But I love them enough that I knew that I want them to be productive citizens. I want them to be caring individuals who love other people. I want them to be responsible and to know that they have to work. I want them to do what is right, and sometimes that means hurting your precious little feelings. Because feelings are fading, and they're fleeting. And how you feel one moment, you may not feel in another moment. Watch the videos of these, of these people now in their 20s. I have watched three videos in the last month of people who their parents allowed them to transition when they were adolescents. All three of them were crying and saying, parents, please be parents to your kids. Don't let them do this to their bodies. When they're older and they're adults and they make those decisions, that's one thing. But don't let them do it now. Love your children enough. It's funny to me. You love your kids enough that you won't let them eat candy every night for dinner, but you'll let them go cut off their genitals to become a different gender. But yet that is what's being screamed at us. As a matter of fact, I heard um, on a television show called The View. I hope none of you watch it. If you do, that may be one point where I would say go repent. But I saw just a little snippet that somebody took and posted online where they had an actress on there this week who said, I can no longer tell the difference between a right-wing Christian and a radical Islamist. They're coming for you. And the question is, what are you going to do with your faith? Because it's about to be tested like it never has before. And it can't just be words of mouth. Let's read this last passage together. Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse 26. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for those sins. Now, I want you to really hear that. I want everybody watching online to really hear that. Because I don't know that we teach this enough in the pulpits across America. If we willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, if we willfully sin, then there no longer remains a sacrifice for that sin. If you know the truth and you know what is right, but you don't do it and you do the opposite willfully. Now, we all make mistakes every day. We all sin every day. There's not a perfect one amongst us, not one. 
But most of us are doing that. It's, it, we just get over in the flesh, and it's not like we willfully set out to do it. But there are some people who know the word of God that it's like, I be gosh, I don't care if she tells me that. I'm going to tell every transgender that I love them and that I accept them. And I'm going to call him ma'am if he wants me to. I'm going to call him by the pronoun he wants to be called. Well, you go ahead. Because the Bible says that if we sin willfully after having received the knowledge of the truth, then there no longer remains a sacrifice for that sin. That's pretty harsh words. But a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose it will be when he will be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. When we knowingly mock the scriptures and refuse to do what he tells us to do. You can go to the extreme one way and become so legalistic and so rigid and you can do everything that the law of Moses and a few traditions that we learn about from the Pharisees, you can do it all and still split hell wide open. We read that at the beginning. Or you can flip over here to the other side and be so, I believe, I believe, I believe, I have the grace of Jesus. We're under grace now, not the law. And have no fruitful works to back it up and split that same hell wide open. Both are extremes where dead carcasses lay, and I can guarantee you that lions are going to be waiting there. They're waiting. They're waiting where all those dead things are. If you know people in your life and around you, if God has not specifically called you to minister to them, let them walk away. Because dead things draw out the lions, and the lions will pounce what comes around. Now that's harsh. I know it is. Because we want to love people so much and sometimes our, our minds can't comprehend. But, but love means I should chase. Love means I should follow. Love means I should talk them into something different. Well, Jesus chased no one. The Bible says that when people turned away and left Jesus, he let them go. You have bigger things to do. You have more important and pressing matters to do and that is souls who are on their way to hell and you've got to be willing to fight that with the works of ministry that will speak to their heart I don't want to see you be a bunch of dead carcasses I don't want to see you hanging out where the dead carcasses are because I know the enemy. I know how he works. I know how easy it is for him to get his clutches on people. And we've got to be a church that is beyond that. Stand with me as we approach the throne of grace. I'm gonna open these altars. Because I know I've seen myself more in the first category than in the second. There were a lot of years that I truly struggled to understand the goodness and the grace of Jesus and how to rest and be in a relationship with him and how to freely follow his spirit that would take me, lead me, and guide me. 
There could be all kinds of rules and regulations and stipulations that we put on ourselves and we put on other people that really, it's just a matter of opinion. It, it's tradition of man. It leaves us feeling guilty and unworthy and all the things that go with it. But then we can err so far on the other side. And this is where I see most of the modern day church is I see that we have erred so far on the other side. I got to tell you this story about Easter. Some of you may have seen it online. I don't know because the videos have been going around. But there's a very well-known church. Big church. Their pastor wanted to do an Easter play this year. He said, I've never preached an Easter sermon before. He was young. He's a young guy and nothing against young pastors. But there's something wrong against young pastors that don't have maturity of the word. He said, I've never preached an Easter service before. So this year, I just want to do a play. I want to write a play. And I want to push it as far to the edge as we can push it. And when the people in his congregation said, well, how far is that, pastor? He said, I want to do everything in this play that is just short of sin. I heard the interview. In case you don't believe me, you probably can search it out. I can't remember his name right now, but you can search it. So they did. They wrote the drama. They performed it. And you think what you saw at the Grammys was bad? What this church did on its platform on Easter Sunday definitely gave it a run for its money. I'm here to tell you there is a philosophy that's out there that is telling you as a believer that you have got to accept every idea and every notion that people are feeling. Or you're not loving and you're not kind. And I'm here to tell you that there is a mandate from heaven that you better tell them what the word says. Because if you play part in that, now I'm going to get real with you here for a minute because you just know that's what I do. Because one day I'm going to stand before the Lord. And this is what the book of Ezekiel tells me. That if you stand before the Lord and there's blood of the people on your hands because you didn't tell them then you're guilty of that blood. But he goes on to say, but if you tell them, and they do it anyway, then you're absolved of that blood. I don't ever want to get before the Lord and say, Lord, and him say there's blood on your hands. And I'm here to tell you, we are in the middle of a war right now with this LGBTQ thing. It is the whole new Black Lives Matter. If you can't see beyond it, let me help you out. It is things that they create in this society to bring division, but here's what's happening. The enemy is able to come in on the clutches of that, and he is able to morph the church into two ways. He's able to take those of us who would be super legalistic and who would be super rigid for us to condemn every single one of them, and they're just crazy, they're out of their mind, they've got devils, they need Jesus, and start barking and preaching at them in a manner they will never receive. Or we can fall to the extreme the other way where we help them in their delusion by going by the pronouns they wish to be addressed by. And I'm here to tell you, it doesn't matter who stands up in your face and tells you that you are hating your waitress if you don't call her a she, if he's a really a he. Now, I'm not saying you go into all these public places causing a scene over pronouns, okay? Hear what I'm saying. There's a balance. There's a balance. But if you got people in your family, I told you I have people in my family. One in particular, I have great conversations with. And we have conversations in depth about religion. I'm praying for him. But I will never accept his lifestyle. And we're at a point right now, you guys, to where dead carcasses are laying. Dead carcasses are laying. And you've got to be brave enough to be one of the ones 
who is going to rescue people from the lions that are lurking around and that you will not fall prey to it yourself. So I'm opening these altars and I want you to come forward. If, you've, if you have ever found yourself on one of these two extremes tonight, because it's real easy to get from one extreme to the other. We need to solidify this with God. We need to make it right with God. And we need to ask Him to help us to live this Christian life in balance with the Word. So come on. If you have found yourself in either place, or even if you haven't, but you don't want to go there, and you just want me to pray over you a holy dose of heavenly wisdom to navigate these waters, because this is territory where we've never been before as a church, as a nation. We've never been here before. God, everyone who is standing in this place tonight or watching online that has ever found themselves at the extreme of, of being religious, of being legalistic, of maybe not have the freedom to just flow in your spirit and to love according to your spirit. God, I pray tonight that you would give wisdom from on high. God, that they would find a, a newness in your scriptures as they read through the life of Christ on how to let Jesus be emulated in their life. God, I pray that all the, the spirits of religion that would try to bind us up, to hold us tight to the law, would be broken right now in the name of Jesus. God, that there would be a freedom in this place to serve you in freedom of the spirit but if you're if you're down here and you're here because of that reason i want you to raise your hand because i feel like i need to pray a very specific prayer if it's because you have felt like you've leaned or are leaning to that religious side of things okay this is what i feel like the lord would have me to say he wants me to pray i know i'm out of the camera but that's okay they can still hear me i believe that the lord does want me to pray specifically against the spirit of fear because it's fear that causes us to do that. It's fear of missing out with God. It's fear that we're not going to be able to please Him. It's fear. That's the master spirit. So God, right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray for these precious folk. God, I have been there and I know the struggle. God, I know how hard it is that deep inside they want to please you, but they're so afraid that they won't be able to. God, right now I come against that spirit of fear in the name of Jesus. I speak to it to release them and let them go. You will no longer be able to whisper the words in their ears that they're not good enough or that they're not going to measure up because their relationship with Jesus is enough. It is enough. It is enough. I'm here to tell you, if you two will look at me for just a minute, whenever I finally got a realization of this, do you know now, I don't ever go to bed feeling guilty anymore. I always go to bed and say, Lord, if there's anything today that I need to make right with you, bring it to my mind. But it's because I just want to please him. I don't feel that guilt and condemnation anymore. And whenever that tries to come on you, you remind that spirit of tonight that it was broken off of you in Jesus' name. And that your relationship with him and loving Jesus is what it takes. And that's all. It's loving Jesus. You remind him of that. Because it will try to whisper to you. But you have more authority over that thing. Now, I'm assuming that the rest of you are down here because you just, you want wisdom. Or how many of you feel like maybe you're on the other side of that? Okay. 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 All right, we're going to pray for that right now in the name of Jesus. God, right now I pray over these that have come down tonight wanting a new, fresh dose of wisdom and boldness from on high. God, this is unchartered territory that we are in as a church and as a nation around the whole world. God, we are seeing things unfolding before our eyes that we never thought that we would see come to fruition in our lifetime, God. But God, I am so grateful. I am so grateful that you have given us your word. That we do not have to go through these uncharted waters alone. But God, you have given us everything we need right there in the book from Genesis to Revelation. 
And God, I pray right now over these that are down here that are asking for a fresh dose of wisdom. God, I pray right now that a fresh infilling of your spirit would fall. God, because with your spirit comes boldness to be a witness. God, I come against the enemy that would try to whisper lies that we are unloving or that we are unkind when we try to speak truth to people. And God, I do pray that you would give us Solomon's wisdom every single day. God, when you sent out your servants, you sent them out to be wise as serpents, yet gentle as doves. And God, I pray that over your people tonight, God, that we would be gentle in how we deal with people, but yet wise and yet bold at the same time, that we can counter everything the enemy is throwing their way. This is what I want to tell you three. I can remember many times during my life people telling me that I wasn't very gentle. Imagine that. And I remember very many times whenever I would be sitting doing my makeup, getting ready for work, because, you know, my day would be so busy. That's about the only time I had, just me and Jesus. And I'd say, God, make me gentle. Make me easy. Make me gentle. Please do something. Rescue me. And he began to show me that, okay, here are some areas where you can be a little more gentle. But don't think that every confrontation has to be a lullaby. And whenever I began to learn the difference between that, you will calm the aggressiveness that's in you by the wisdom of God because he'll teach you. He will teach you that. If you're asking for boldness, he'll teach you. But don't be surprised when the moments come, because if you're asking for boldness, he's going to give you moments that are going to require that boldness to be stretched. And we always have to be very careful when we're dealing with sinners. Now, here's the difference, okay? Here's the difference. We talked about this tonight in the life of Jesus. Here's the difference. Whenever it came to the sinners, Jesus was so tender, so tender. He always confronted them in their sin, just like the woman at the well. Listen, you've had this man, this man, this man, this man, this man. Now, let's go on and not have any more. But he didn't say, well, you've had this man, and you've had this man, and you had that one. You see the difference? There can become an art to speaking the truth in love when we're confronting, especially those in the world. But now listen how he did religious folks. You hypocrite. Your mama is a brood of snakes. You are like whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. Now he loved the religious man just as much as he did the sinner, but one required a deeper measure of grace while the other required their fanny to be smacked. And that's the wisdom that I'm praying over you. Because right now what we're finding is that the church is fighting against the church. We are trying to reach a culture, but we're we're fighting against churches that want to have practical seances on stage to celebrate the resurrected king. And they're calling it good. We cannot sit by and just let that go that we don't call it out boldly. That's a whole lot different than if you're talking to sinners who are sitting at the Grammys because they don't know different. Do you see? So God, as we get ready to leave this place, raise your hand for the blessing. I am blessing them tonight, Lord God, with wisdom, wisdom from on high. God, I pray that everything that you gave to Solomon when he asked you, God, that you would give to us tonight, God, because we are standing before you humbly asking you for wisdom to help us navigate. God, to help us know the right words to say in the right moment. God, to help us have the perfect Holy Ghost timing on confrontation. We don't want to get ahead of you. We don't want to slip behind you. But God, we are more dependent on your spirit than ever before on to know when to speak and what to speak. And God, I pray that we would have that wisdom, God. We do not want to be full of dead carcasses where the lions can feed. And we certainly don't want to leave dead carcasses in our wake for the lions to feed. 
God, I thank you so much for your word that has gone forward tonight, God. And I know that it is going to perform the task that you have sent it out to do. God, be with your people this week. Keep them safe. Keep them healthy. Keep them whole. And bring them back together to worship again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.